guys. Are these not corks? No, the little mini bottles are not. No, but we gave it so that you have long term, you have a wine key to use. No, I love it. I just totally tried to use it though and was like, what have I done? Yeah, we're, we're tricking people into like, are you paying attention? Have you already had a glass <laughs> of wine before you try to open your wine? But the foil is kind of difficult to get off sometimes. So the little knife is helpful. It is helpful. And no, I have not. I'm just, it's later for me than it is for you guys. So yeah, for sure. Welcome everyone. Uh, we're gonna wait a couple minutes, let some people join here. Hey, Larissa. Hi. Close. Yeah. Need to get a glass. Yeah. And we'll get some glasses. Kristen. few minutes then we'll get started pretty quickly because mm -hmm. you know reward people for being on time versus holding <laughs> everyone up <laughs> got to get to the wine got to get to the wine drink nothing nothing's going to keep us in the way of that yeah <clears throat> hi danica i don't know if she heard me <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know there are a few other people who we know were joining Jay mm -hmm. and a few others. There's some I mean, and Patrick. Yeah, we can wait a couple more minutes. Yeah, um, for sure. While uh, you guys are getting settled in, we would advise Suggest. get four different wine glasses out. We've got different ones but they don't have to they be They can different. all be the same shape or size. If that's all you have, that's okay. Um, but yeah, it's kind of fun to go back and forth and compare and contrast and taste through things. And um, instead of just trying to sample and then move on to the next one. And I know you're only dirtying one wine glass then. <laughs> and if Suzanne can make a meal in only one, one pot, pot, that's, that's what I'm like doing. Her crowning achievement of the day. Yeah. So. See, Jenna gets me, Jenna gets me. No extra dishes. Yeah. <laughs> Evan, Evan, on the other hand, is like, I will dirty every dish in the kitchen to make like one meal. Well, it's, it's just because I worked <laughs> in restaurants long enough that I just saw like. He's oh, used to having a dishwasher. All you have to do is pay attention to the food and not try to wash yeah, stuff yeah. while you're cooking. Then you don't turn around and be like, oh gosh, why is it smoking? That's right. He's used to having <laughs> a dishwasher. But That's not... great if you have a dishwasher. Yeah. <laughs> I, I am not dishwasher. a dishwasher, no. <laughs> you just put the stuff in there and turn it on. Yeah, I have friends that actually have dishwashers in their apartments and I'm super jealous, but I um, <laughs> do not. Yeah. And another pro tip, don't ever wash your wine glasses at night before you go to bed. That's how you break them. Yeah. Just so that in the next day put them on the side of the sink if there's a red wine glass put a little water in it so it doesn't kind of get all junky especially especially if it's, if it's Syrah yeah at least in my experience for whatever reason that grape stains glasses so much more than others yeah for sure hello Abigail hello Justin we're excited everyone's getting organized and getting in here <clears throat> I think we're going to get started in one more minute because it's almost 5.05 and I'm saying five minutes. Yep. Five minutes is all people get to. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Although I feel like when we were in grade school, we'd say if the teacher was 15 minutes late, you could leave. Class was canceled, but that's the other way around. Right. Yeah. We're not late. We're here. You're tardy as soon as the bell yeah, rings. Sure. Yeah. They didn't give you that same courtesy in the other <laughs> direction. I can just be 15 minutes late. It's fine, teacher. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> or if you're in hospitality, 15 minutes early is on time. Yes, yes, that's right. That's the other end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, don't be running in the door right, up, right as service is about to start. Be in big, big trouble. And with the airline industry, <clears throat> it's just like when we close the door, that's official. It yeah. doesn't matter when the plane actually gets off the ground. For sure. The jetway is closed, therefore we're on time. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I say we get started. Sure. We have enough people here. I know some other people will be joining, but that is okay. So welcome everyone. I'm Suzanne. I'm the founder of The Crafty Cast. 
And we are all about celebrating and supporting craft alcohol makers like the wonderful Kibble Spot Sellers, who we'll be introducing you to tonight. And my name is Evan. I'm a certified sommelier, a certified cider professional, um, whiskey enthusiast, equal opportunity craft beer drinker. Um, he is your boozy expert. <laughs> well, we have another one tonight. We do have another one tonight. We have Sam with us. Sam is the winemaker at Kibble Spot Cellars. Hello, Sam. Say hi. Hi, guys. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. It's going to be awesome. I'm super excited. And we are super excited to have him here, especially because it is right in the middle of harvest. We are kind of assholes we for are making him do very this right much now. <laughs> that he is willing to spend any time at all with us right now. Yes. Sleep and work yeah. for the months of September and October. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For those of you who aren't connected to the wine industry, harvest is something else. Maybe Sam will tell us a little something about it, but it is like night and day all day long. So we're thrilled he'll be here, but we do only have him for a little while. So we're going to get rocking and rolling. Um, we are so excited for our very first Sip Scout party. Sip Scout has been a dream coming for a very, very long time. We have had fans asking us for years, like, you guys tell us about all this cool craft booze. How do we actually get to drink it? Um, and it's been hard. It's hard to ship alcohol. It's hard to get craft alcohol to people, especially small craft makers don't often have great distribution. They can't ship all over the country. So it's been something we've been working on for years. Yep. Um, and we have finally figured it out and we are so excited to do this. And this is the first party. So we'll be doing this once a month. Um, I know quite a few of you are members and quite a few of you, thank you, have signed up for three month and six month members all, right off the bat. So thank you for that. I think you're trusting us. Um, so we'll be doing this the third Thursday of every month going forward. Mm -hmm. um, I think today's the fourth Thursday actually of September. Just by but, circumstance, you know, yeah. Um, and, you know, we're going to keep these casual. Um, so if, for those of you who have been to our events in the past, we used to do virtual tastings all the time during the pandemic. Those were a little more structured. We did a little more like robust teaching, robust kind of like going through things one at a time and everything. Honestly, we felt like you guys didn't get to talk enough when we did that. Um, yeah, and so sure. since this is a membership club and since we'll be seeing lots of your faces regularly, we hope, um, we'd like for all of us to get to know each other, get to talk about craft alcohol, get to ask your questions. You get to use this time the way you want it. And, you know, you get all these awesome educational things in your kit. So you can learn about things as you go. Your SIP Scout report tells you a little bit about Kibble Scott Cellars already. We also told you a little bit about each one of the wines that we'll be drinking. So you have those educational materials. You also have the digital tasting techniques that we linked to. Those are awesome. That's what we used to spend a lot of time on during these sessions is teaching the tasting techniques. You'll see us, especially Evan, doing some of the tasting techniques. So if you notice it, if you have questions, if you <laughs> want a reminder about what that technique is, just jump in and ask us. Yes. You have your handy dandy wine wheel. We'll probably talk a little bit about this probably. later because this is a really cool tool um, to use. And in, a, in an effort to, as we said, keep it casual, why don't we raise a glass and say cheers. Uh, to one another and the first Sip Scout party and Kibblestad and to all of you for being here, especially Sam. Yes. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. So like we said, for those of you who joined a couple minutes later, we would suggest getting four wine glasses and pouring all four of them out. Um, we're going to kind of be sampling around, tasting and trying. Yeah. If you want to drink them in order, we'd probably suggest the Sauvignon Blanc, the Rosé, then the Casey Lab Zin, finishing with the red blend. The KC Labs in, I would suggest putting it in the fridge for 20 minutes before you drink it. It's a really fun, like cool. Sam's nodding with me. I, it seems like <laughs> he agrees. I love this wine when it's a little chilled. It's awesome for warm weather. And I know a lot of us still have warm weather. Um, so I would suggest chilling that down for 20 minutes. And if you've never had a chilled red, it's a kind of a fun experience. Yeah, uh, it's a really fun, unique kind of uh, take on red wine. Yeah, <clears throat> but other than that, Please feel free to unmute yourselves, chime in whenever you have questions. If we're in the middle of saying something and you have a thought, feel free to throw it in the chat. We'll be keeping an eye there too. But unmute yourselves, ask questions, interrupt us. I'm a talker, he's a talker, Sam's a talker. Um, <laughs> hey, Sam can keep up with me, man. Yeah, Sam's true. a talker too. Um, but jump in and ask your questions. And then at the end of each Sip Scout party every um, month, we're gonna make sure we keep a little dedicated time to say, who's traveling? Who's going somewhere in the next month? Do you need help figuring out what craft makers to visit? Has anyone else been there? We'll do a little sip scouting among us. So you can sip scout for your next trip because 
you know, those of us who've joined this membership, we all like to travel for our case. And maybe we'll learn about a new producer that you love that we might feature in a future sip scale party. And restaurants too, you know, whatever. Sure. I know Tipplers gotta eat. So <laughs> <laughs> all right. So with that, um, we're going to jump on in. Yeah. So we told you what order we'll be drinking them in. And you know, we'll casually kind of touch on each wine as we get to them. If you open a wine and you're curious about something, you're tasting something, you're smelling something, just jump in and say, hey, I just opened the rosé. Like, what's going on here? Can you tell me a little bit about it? Um, so you can kind of keep us moving along to what you're interested in, too. Um, but other than that, I think we're going to yeah. kick it over to Sam to introduce himself and tell us a little bit about Kibble Salt Cellars. Cool. Um, welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for spending some time with us. Um, so I'm Sam. I'm borderline delirious from Harvest, but I'm sure that I'll still be kind of, you know, I kind of put it together. Um, but I, my great passion is kind of what I, what I call utilitarian craft. Um, I'm, a, I'm obviously like a winemaker, a wine grower by trade, but I'm also a pretty serious potter. Um, and those two things really kind of connect to me in this, in philosophically. So I love making stuff that people touch and use and kind of invest power in with their relationship with it. Um, it's kind of like my obsession in that. And so I, I definitely like, I know a lot about the production of the wines, but I think your relationship with the wines is kind of what gets me excited, has a lot more like power than my relationship with the wines and the beauty of being somebody who makes a lot of bowls and mugs and cups and wines, all these things that influence people's day to day. It's just this really kind of ethereal way for me to touch different people and like kind of love the craft and have have people use the products and kind of define their own relationship and power within them. So that's my thing. Um, in order to do that with wine, um, I really focus on minimal intervention. So all the wines you taste will be ambient yeast, um, ambient malactic for those that go through malactic um, and just wines that are really designed to be food and wine friendly. It's super important to me. Um, and also price point friendly. I think there's something that doesn't get talked about enough with art, which is that like price point really defines the relationship that people will have with your craft, right? So like I describe you know, with my ceramics, right? I could sell the bowls for a lot of money. Um, but what I've had happen with people is that they then don't use those bowls. And that's not the goal, right? My goal is for to make craft that people can really interact with and define their own relationship with and like put power into. And when you put power into it and understand it, like I think that's what's really cool about making things for other people. Um, and so, so yeah, everything you taste will be organically farmed. Um, that's extremely important to me. I believe that like the longest lasting interaction I'll have with this planet is the way that these vineyards are treated in the long term, right? There's this beauty to wine. It's ethereal. It captures a moment. It kind of transitions, but ultimately it's fairly short lived, right? It's the, the greatest of my wines will be able to taste 20 years down the road, 30 years down the road, but my relationship with these vineyards and treating these vineyards with love and respect is by far the most important thing that I will touch outside of my daughter and my wife and my future son. I have a one-year-old, so, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but so I don't know how you guys, how you guys, I love it when you chime in. It'll be much more interesting for all of us if it's an open conversation. There are no dumb questions. I'm a huge dork. So like, all right, got it. Larissa. Hit yeah, me. not not a huge like new <laughs> to the wine world. Yeah. So um ambient yeast, does that mean yeast that's cool. already on the grapes or a hundred percent? That's exactly okay. what that means. So I think most people don't know, and something that I think, you know, Suzanne and Evan have really championed that I'm that I'm super happy with and super proud to partner with them are these kind of smaller, more minimal interventionist producers. It's something that is a tiny movement in the wine world, but a really important one, right? And so I've got to spend time all over the world. I've spent a lot of time in Europe and Madrid and kind of worked with these masters. I think it's a beauty of craft is that mentorship, right? And when you're, I think when you're an artist, like I obviously like, uh, anyways, when you're an artist, I think like you never really create anything, right? 
humanity's been around for a long time, art's been around for a long time, craft's been around for a long time. And so mostly we're just kind of like standing on the shoulders of these greats who came before us and trying to pay homage with them and have a conversation with history, right? And so, and I, the way that I do that is I started tasting all these wines that really kind of blew my mind. And then I went and met those producers and tasted with them. And what I learned from most of them is they weren't using a lot of the modern techniques that I was taught at Davis, right? So I, I'm, I have a second bachelor's degree from Davis. So I kind of, I, I started in a much more traditional wine sense for kind of modern winemaking. But then slowly but surely, I kind of like, I do think you need to learn the basics. Like you need to learn the rules to break them, right? It's something that I think about a lot with like, I don't know if anybody's, spent time in Spain. There's a bunch of like museums in Madrid with Picasso. And if you see the early Picassos, they're really kind of traditional imperialist. He was a really, really talented kind of fine artist in that traditional way. And then he started breaking the rules, right? And like, so I have that same scientific background in terms of like modern contemporary winemaking, which is much more chemical engineering than it is like craft. I would say it's much more like making a factory, you know, it's all about additions and controlling stuff and really dominating the product. So it's very human. And those people don't necessarily love wine more or less than I do. I would say they're much more exacting than I am. But the relationship that I always wanted to have with wine, and I think the relationship that speaks to more and more consumers and the relationship that people want to have to wine is to know that they're not these chemically engineered products, right? The beauty of wine is that it has so much inherent stability, right? And that, that there's a reason it's been around for 2000 years, right? This is super dorky. Beer is at a pH of seven, wine's at a pH around orange juice, right? And so orange juice will stay will like it, but it doesn't have sugar. Anyway, so like at that- I didn't know that speak of orange juice. That's like an interesting, cause we all know what orange juice- but Totally, orange right, juice. Right? Yeah. Right? And so it's just inherently more stable because of that acid. It's an inherent my, antimicrobial, which is why you don't hear about minimalist beer, right? Cause minimalist beer would be super oxidized. It'd be super funky. I mean, you, you, it's, it's essentially like Britannomyces, all those kind of sour beers are in essence minimalist beer, but it's not what people generally associate with it, right? And so, because of the inherent, I'm going to land the question. I'm pretty ADD, you can tell, <laughs> but I'm going to, I'm going to stick the landing. <laughs> and so, because I kind of really, st really studied, um, really knew the chemistry, and then started studying these greats, these minimalist greats, I learned that like the yeast from the vineyard are much more interesting. They're going to be more complex, right? And so like, so stuff like that, not being super interventionalist, not adding a bunch of, you know, there's because of FDA regulations, there are 200 additives you can add to wine. You don't have to put anything on the label, which is insane. It's a whole other- Yeah, did you guys know that? There are 200 different things that you can add to wine and it's nowhere on the label. Yep. Have yeah. you read Cork Dork by Bianca Bosker? Yes. Yeah, I didn't yeah, yeah. realize until I started, I had a reaction to a medication, but also to a wine. And that's yeah. how I figured out that there was an additive that I didn't know, but it was on the medication totally. label. And I would say like, generally those additives are in 99% of wines, right? It's this huge percentage of wines. Whereas like if ingredients labels were required, like my wines would say grapes and sulfur, right? I think that's really important. That's what people picture in People have been using sulfur for 2000 years. Like people don't realize how much water, acid, all these different things are added to their wines in order to make a homogenous product. And, and I think that can be really interesting for particularly for people who are much more like chemically engineering brain, want to have that relationship of domination where they're really controlling the product and creating a homogenous product. Um, I think homogeneity is really boring um, but, but that's, there's some implicit bias there, I guess. Um, I think the beauty of wine is the variation between years, is the variation between yeast and different vineyards, are all those kind of things from those microclimates that kind of really make these wines so special. And so, um, so it's really cool to do that at a reasonable price. I think like we're all blessed that I think, you know, 
if you're here, you probably have the means to buy a twenty to forty dollar bottle of wine, right? And like, and that's really cool. And like, I don't want to diminish too much like a ten dollar bottle of wine, but those are a hundred percent of ten dollar bottles of wines are very very commercial products, right? They're, they're, they're chemically great. delicious. They, yeah, they're <laughs> They're great base products. They're not wine the way that we think about them. Yeah. Right? Hey, Sam, just to interject really briefly on the price point there, because I think you make a great point. Um, and I, I would venture to say that that is very much true here in the United States. And would you feel like you could speak to the prevalence of that statement being a blanket one that is equal in a place like Spain? Or, I mean, not Spanish wines that we would get here, but if you were actually in Spain, Wine. Oh, for sure. In so a ten dollar bottle that was made right. the way that you are making wine at Kibblestock, correct? For sure. So if you live in Madrid, so I lived in Madrid. Um, I live in Madrid. Lucky Madrid. man. <laughs> um, I love Spain, and, and Spanish Thank wine you. is one of my great loves. And when you're cruising around Spain or Italy, right, you'll have these places that'll pour you these super fun wines, like the Casey Labs, right? Mm -hmm. The Spain does a bunch of this carbonic stuff that I'm really into right they'll make these these riojas you know from tempranillo all this stuff and when you're in so i spent time in lagronio where rioja is from their table wine is amazing right and a lot of it is coming out of a jug on the table it's fermented the way that i ferment it they, they learn from their great great grandparents and you know it's 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 very much they also i i i always want to be really careful like europe makes very commercial wines as well but what you also have is a really inherent like food and wine culture where you just you tend to get a lot more bang for your buck, buck in Europe also because land is a lot cheaper in Europe. Um, but one of the other things I heard Sam when I, I was in France a, cu a couple summers ago and I kept asking people like why yeah. is great wine so much cheaper and more affordable here than it is and one of the things I kept hearing from the them was you know, we are multi-generational family wineries. And so we've paid off our mortgage. We have paid off our wine like decades ago. So we don't yeah, have true. those fixed costs anymore. So it's really yeah. just, and that was something, and like that doesn't exist as much here. Like I, no. I think a lot of winemakers would like to hand it down to their kids, but it's a hard no, work really. and a lot of them don't want it. So you end up selling yeah. it for millions of dollars and then you have a mortgage again and you have the land price again. Really. So and so that's actually one of the weird things about the craft, right? Like I got into it because I obviously love the craft of creating something. But in order to get a product that can, and I want to compete with Europe. Those are the ones I drink. Those are the ones I love. I think those are the ones that say the most about a place and have the most power for my palate. Um, and in order to compete with Europe, one of the things that I have learned to do is kind of like, negotiate really aggressively on glass price and cork price and late right all these kind of intangibles that aren't very artistic but it it helps to have to you have to do it in order to compete with the world right competing within the united states isn't very interesting to me because there are very few people who have the same passions that i do and that kibblestat does um and so so yeah it's totally true i think we're it's an uphill battle um you know and it changes every year based on vintages here there and everywhere i mean that's the beauty of agriculture but um ultimately like the goal is to have a relationship with nature and get to pass that on to all of you and so you can have real wines and i think there's a lot of power i think there's much more power in a table wine than a trophy um and that's something that's like super super important to me like talking about those wines that you drink on the table in in spain and italy and france and germany um we don't have that same relationship here i mean we're taught here if you see house wine or table wine at a restaurant like run in the other cool. direction like, and then you've got and then you've got a 14.99 wine that says reserva on it and it's like yeah. you know it's like we're really kind of we're really diminishing a lot of these things that mean a lot to Europe. Um, and, and I believe in paying, like in having communication with your mentors and like paying homage to the people who you really respect. And that's why like, you know, we definitely, I'm never going to make a reserva of anything. Um, <laughs> but like, I love making great wine and I love kind of passing that on to people who get to taste it. So 
Um, you are doing some really cool things at Kibblestaw, so you may never make a reserva, but Kibblestaw is unique. It's a, can you tell us a little bit about how you yeah, got so, how you got there, and what you love about like their ethos? Yeah, so Kibblestaw's really cool. Uh, so I kind of I came up through. I worked Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, and then so I I worked in Napa, California, and then New Zealand, and then France. Um, and then I actually worked at Brock Sellers in Berkeley. I was a system winemaker there. Um, and Chris is a mentor and a super homie. I talk to him all the time. He's the best. Um, but like, we really wanted to change the industry in California. And I talked a lot about moving to Europe and purchasing grapes out there and kind of making these European wines that really inspire me there. But I wanted to fight for California to compete globally. Like a lot of people, uh, I think California has developed a kind of negative re reputation for these very human homogenous wines. Mm -hmm. um, and that is all based on human decision, not based at all on the terroir, right? And so I knew that we had great vineyards out here and we have this kind of like uh, a, a commercial ecosystem where we can compete worldwide. We just didn't have people championing these other varietals, right? You're gonna pay so much more for Cabernet Sauvignon and Chardonnay and so, like, right? So Cab and Chardonnay, right? Like how do we get outside of this, this ecosystem? And so a really important thing for me is working with these different varietals, which you'll see, you got Sauvignon Blanc, you've got a rosé of Carignan and Grenache, um, the Casey Labs in, and then uh, the father's watch around red. And so, and Jordan Kibblestaff's the owner, Jordan and I are of an age, Jordan, Jordan and I are kind of in our mid to late thirties. Um, and he saw the same thing as he climbed the ladder in California, that there weren't wines for us and there weren't places for us. Like I'm covered in tattoos, right? I'm, I'm an artist, right? I'm not a businessman. <laughs> so like, so, um, and also just, go ahead. I was just going to say, Sam, being of an age and, and, you know, growing up in wine country, as I believe both of you did, right? Yeah. How did you, how did you connect? Because obviously, like, so, uh, yeah, so worlds spin really, around each other and you both have the same ethos. Totally. And so I was, a, I was, I, I started Leyloon and Populous, which are a couple brands also with Martha Stuman. Martha Stuman's like really blowing up. Those are like some of my best friends. We all went to Vegas together and then we traveled Europe together and we started those brands. We had four winemakers and no accountant. It's a terrible business model. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so Martha split off to make her own wines. At that point, I was the assistant winemaker at this Cabernet house called Nickel and Nickel. So I would kind of like make my wines that I love by night. And then by day, I'd make these really straight and narrow commercial. It's like I was playing for the Yankees by day and then I was like Dexter at night you know like, <laughs> yeah just for those of you who maybe are unfamiliar with nickel and nickel it's kind of a it's a kind of a premium luxury house yeah, in sure. Napa Valley and it's a really kind of like you're speaking to it perfectly Sam they source fruit from some of the most exquisite vineyard sites all yeah. over Napa Valley and every expression of the Cabernet Sauvignon that you would think would be so demonstrably different because it's coming from these completely different terroirs are all kind of really homogenous. Really <laughs> homogenous. And then what and then what you learn from being in that environment for a long time um, is that they're homogenous because of all these modern winemaking techniques, right? Which like, you know, people are adding a lot of water and acid to wine, um, and and then using all kinds of stuff, you know, using a lot of preservatives that they use in Coca-Cola and Gatorade. Um and a lot of manipulation and not to say that that's not artistic as well, right? I think it's even more controlling, but it's much more of a focus on the, the prod, like you receive the grapes and then you manipulate them. Whereas like, I love to focus on what we can do in the vineyard to make grapes healthy so we don't have to manipulate them. Yeah, it's kind of like the difference between the art of nature yeah. and the art of you as a winemaker. And then you've got this like palette of, colors, i.e. the different chemicals that you can use to create the thing that you want. Congratulations, you did it. Or let Mother Nature show you what her art is by kind of setting that. Yeah. 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 It's 100%. It's kind of like the way that you tied your art in, Sam, it sounds yeah. like I went to a theater conservatory for a long yeah. time. Yeah. And that's what it sounds like. It's like, hey, totally. get, get in the box. Instead totally. Of like, and like, let's go. Do. And yeah, I think 
I totally like, I think, so I really firmly, this is going to get, I really fir firmly believe that different art forms will influence other art forms. And so like, so I am, I'm a very adept potter, like in a, for a utilitarian, I work with a bunch of restaurants, I sell a bunch of work. Um, and like, as my pottery has evolved and I start doing different things, I started painting, I started kind of combining stuff. And then that translated to me thinking about like, well, what could you do with wine that was like more outside the box? And so now we're making like a Gravignon Blanc. I do a Gravenstein apple. Got it right blanc. here. Oh, cool. So much fun, right? And so like, I think we'll back being artistic there. teaches you to think outside the box. Whereas like a lot of the people who want to make those more contemporary wines are very much scientists, right? And I think there's a beauty to that as well. Um, but it's a different relationship with the craft, right? And it just, it's all about the relationship you want to have with the craft and the people you, you like interact with, right? Like, I'm not here to tell you about like how expensive the wines are and like the points I got. It's just not my thing. And it never made me excited. And I just don't think art can be rated that way. Like I'm here to tell you, like I've done the best that I can to make wines with soul that should be able to integrate into your day-to-day -day life at a reasonable price so that you can actually like enjoy them and you can define what makes them beautiful. And I think that's the most important thing with art. And it's like wine, there's so many people trying to slam pretension down your throat so they can sell stuff very expensively, right? They're creating that scarcity, they're creating insecurity so that people think the only way to get a good bottle of wine is spend a lot of money. But that's bullshit. <laughs> I, mean, I feel like anytime someone walks up to you and is like, oh my God, you have to try this wine, it's $130 a bottle. Yeah. I'm just like, that's not why I have to try that wine. Yeah. Like, you know, and I, I think there's a lot of that, you know, there's a lot of wineries that have been built on that. 100%, I mean, it's a really successful business model. It's just like, I think there's a lot of cynicism in that business model and those yeah. people who make those wines drink these wines. Yeah. <laughs> like that's ultimate, like my, I have a bunch of buddies in the industry who like, they love my wines and they never drink their wines because they're making them for their trophies, right? They're designed to be trophies. So you buy them and you sit on them. And I just don't, I, I, I really didn't like the relationship I had with with the product, with the one, with something that I think should be beautiful, but it just becomes about how much it costs, what and in these scores that one person gave it, and that's just not how art works. Yeah, I'd much rather have the problem of like I keep opening these wines, and therefore I keep running out of these wines. That's a way better. Problem. I don't know when to open this wine because I spent so much money on it, and I'm trying right. to like figure it out, right? And that that is the problem we have with your wines is we mm. buy a case and then like. A little while later, we're like, oh no, do we only have two bottles of kibble stat left? Because they are priced at a, like we are comfortable opening them whenever we are in the mood for it. And they're delicious. Oh, and that's know, amazing. Yeah, that's what makes me really excited. Thank you. That's exactly, it's working. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I do have to leave soon, but you do have to tell us a little bit about carbonic maceration and kind of yeah. some of the cool stuff that you're doing. And before you jump into that, because you've brought up pottery now a couple times, and I know that in speaking with you in previous instances, that that's a significant part of your life as well. And I've kind of been curious if there is a potential of an intersection of those, perhaps creating a wine. neat wine vessel that could then, it wouldn't be so, a reserve wine because Kibblestadt will never make a reserve wine. Wow. Yeah, so I so I do a bunch of pottery. So we have a restaurant at Kibblestadt that's a fully functioning restaurant. We have this amazing chef who's like Our totally has so my ethos, but has kind of pushed that towards food, right? And she's making sourdough from scratch. She's doing this and that. And so I work with her a lot in order to like, in order to, so I make mugs for the restaurant. I make spittoons for the restaurant. I oh, There's a bunch of my ceramics at the restaurant. And then I have multiple other restaurant partners. I think like, I ultimately think that ceramics reaches its like apotheosis. It reaches its greatest heights with a good chef, right? And like, I don't think about ceramics as much as like, a, as much connected inherently to, to wine directly as a vessel, right? Like I love making the spittoons. I think that's really cool. And like, yeah. I think stuff you touch a lot should be beautiful. Like my daughter, like 
my compost bin and my daughter's diaper pail are like ceramic things that I made, right? Because I touch them all the time, right? And so that. like, but I ultimately think that like ceramics reaches its its greatest heights, like when a beautiful chef like puts ramen in your ramen bowl you know, <laughs> that you made. Sure. And, like, so I don't think it will connect. It's more like, I really find that the philosophies that I read from... You know, I don't know if you know who Joji Hamada or Bernard Leach, like these kind of like these people eats meet, eat meets West, East meets West kind of post-World War II as is kind of more industrial manufacturing started to hit, who really start wanting to champion craft, things that are handmade that will have variation. It's the philosophies that really kind of coexist and combine to me more than like me wanting to make a wine bottle that and I've made tons of decanters and like that stuff the decanters were cool but like a part of the beauty of a good decanter is you can see the wine right and if I don't I can't throw glass so like you know I really believe that the stuff should be useful right and not just pretty and like and I believe it with both wine and so there won't be there won't be like a, a like direct connect but then like you know people people have that connection to the wines through the ceramics people will buy spittoons at the tasting room i sell a bunch of mugs at the tasting room we donate to a bunch of cool charities you know like so yeah 100 percent of the ceramics gets donated to charity i'm not here to, to like hype my ceramics but <laughs> yeah, the wine is in those mugs those mugs are full of wine yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> Exactly, <laughs> but that's a really nice sentiment, and I think that that's a right, uh, a, the right way to kind of delineate it. As as you started to explain it, like something that's beautiful, like a wine glass, you you open it and then you you discard it. Like yeah. you don't, want, you don't want that to be your pottery. You want it to last a lifetime. Yeah, I want somebody to really like touch. Like that's why I think salad bowls, coffee mugs, plates, you know, bowl like stuff that people touch every day. Um, and it's like, you know, and the wine, like that's why I really want to make wines at a price where people can touch them and develop their own relationship with them. Um, because tasting so different for everybody, palate so different for everybody. Um, and, and like, I just don't want wines to be intimidating. So the Carbonic, we were talking about the Carbonic. So like Carbonic is this really traditional style out of Beaujolais primarily, but then there's a lot of carbonic now coming out of everywhere. It's really complicated fermentation style where you do 100% whole cluster. It's really heavy CO2 and the CO2 will essentially create a fermentation within the berries, creates all these really estery, tutti fruity, high tone notes, right? So like I can take all that dorky stuff really seriously, but then ultimately if you taste the Zin, it's just gonna be this high toned, red, fun, easy drinking Zinfandel, it's gonna kick ass, right? And so like, even though I love to get into the nitty gritty of the science and, and dork out on the craft, like the ultimate product is actually one of the least sophisticated, it's designed just to be fun and easy drinking and make you smile. And we say glue glue, a lot and that's because like you open the glass and all you hear is or you open the bottle and then all you hear is glue 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 because it's just getting poured out poured out poured out like i love that i love yeah. wines that are so good but not serious um the zinfandel is a 70 year old hillside zinfandel vineyard it's been dry farmed since inception so never ever irrigated which is super important in california um of the wines you have in front of you everything but the Sauvignon Blanc dry farm it's really important to me um I said everything's organic and then the Sauvignon Blanc biodynamic um so for those does everyone know what dry farming means and is and what how that benefits the the wine dry farming is never irrigated in its entire life so it's all just precipitation from the environment and nothing else and in California with the water issues right now it's a really big deal. It's really important that we start to focus on bridles and old vines and all this stuff. And with California and the way land prices are, people are really incentivized to push these vines super hard to produce a lot in a finite period of time and then rip them out and start over. Because the land's so expensive, it's actually financially viable to essentially plant on a 20 year time scale and then rip it out and start over. But wines, like grapevines don't reach maturity until 20 or 30 years old, right? They're tearing them out before they can even get good because they're not gonna push as much yield. They're not gonna create as many grapes. But once they create less grapes, you get more concentration, you get more flavor, you get these more focused wines, right? So 
you can't um, as much wine. And so that's okay. where the business versus the art kind of clashes a little bit. And with dry okay. farmed wines, correct me if I'm wrong, Sam, you know, the benefit of this, and especially this is commonly practiced in Europe. This is com right. like very common there. It's required in many in places. Many places. Required, yeah. But the benefit really, so you hear people talk about terroir a lot more when they're talking about European and old world wines. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for that is the dry farming, because when they're dry farmed, the roots have to go much deeper to find the groundwater and to like really go down deep. Exactly. Whereas if you're watering them constantly, those roots are staying kind of shallow at the surface. So they're not bringing in the minerals and all of those like things yeah, that the give nutrients the flavor. The strata of going, grapevines can go down 30, 40, 50 feet totally. to find groundwater. And the amount of variation in the soil that you find when they're doing that is drastic compared yeah. to the strata at the surface. Yeah. Absolutely. 100%. So I have to boogie in five minutes. Um, but do you guys, what do you guys think of the wines? The big, the, you got yeah. the power thumb right now. You can tell me. Uh, maybe. It comes up. Yeah. Bronx biodynamic. Which? Did, did you, you saw say me this? on Bronx biodynamic? Yeah. Gotcha. Um, and everything you taste will be older than fifty-year-old vines today. Um, topping out at 70, 75 year old vines. So old vine. Um, Farm with love, no herbicides, no pesticides, just like really honest wine. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, I think all of these bottles are like around 40 or less. I think oh. this is the most expensive at 38. Yep. Yeah. Oh, cheaper. I'd say I'd say everything that you guys are tasting 30. on the web on our yeah. website is 25 to 30 bucks. Yeah. yeah. It's a really amazing quality and value um, yeah. and, and an amazing story and art, like with the carbonic maceration. I don't know. The Zin, I love the flavors of Zin, but Zins can be kind of heavy. Zins can be, you know, really big and rich. And I'm not always in the mood for that. And I love that this carbonic maceration with the Zin makes it light and zippy and just like kind of easy drinking. Yeah. Totally. Totally. I'm sick to drink that. I didn't, I knew I was only going to have one. And since I live alone, I didn't want to do the full tasting because... Yeah. I mean, full disclosure, I work with Crafty Cask, so I usually have a lot of open yeah. things in my fridge. And yeah. I knew that I was drinking a lot. Because <laughs> I have to get up early tomorrow and I live in New York. So I was like, no, no, yeah. no. Um, so I just stuck with a Sav Blanc, which is delightful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But now I'm really kind of wishing I threw the Zin in the fridge and, and did that. Yeah. There's always tomorrow. Does anyone have any questions for Sam before he has to run out? No. Thank you guys so much for your time. And you really like, you know, as we've all gotten more and more accustomed to virtual, it's really special to get to like hang out with people and talk about the craft. So you like, I know I can be really talky. So I hope you glean great information. Um, I talk a lot and. Um, hey, but, Sam, one, one final question in the last two minutes. Yeah. I'm just curious because I'm it's it's my first time not being near wine country during harvest in a while. Oh, yeah. It what's it, what's going on? Is there anything unique? It's great year special? and like I'm I'm I like to be really honest about that. You know, everybody says every year is a great year, but for me, um, it's been a really mild summer, which has been cool. The squash, like my squash, have been going like I've eaten squash every day for two months you know like and usually they'll kind of flame out or they'll get mildew or whatever but it's just been like 80 to 85 every day and then we had a hot spell for a week two weeks ago but I had all my whites in already um and and so like I was in a really good position to weather the heat wave then we got a little bit of rain I walked some of the stuff today and kind of tasted the skins it's, it's when it rains, skins will swell up and then come back down, but they soften a lot, so I'll get better color and extraction. So I push those out. I don't have any sense of mildew. It's been a really killer year, and of course, no fires, right? We're really worried about fires nowadays, and like, it's been really special to like... I stress have, from that so far, huh? ...have this year that there are no fires, and it's also like, when it's cool, you can really focus on the flavor so much, so I've got to really lock that in. Um, so it's been a special year, and... Yeah, I, I put the website on the uh, on the chat. If any of you guys are ever in Sonoma, please come see us at the restaurant. It's awesome. And if you're so inclined, it really like we're a tiny team. So if you guys decide to buy wine, um, you honor me, and that'd be awesome. You know, yeah. on the website, and uh, and you're really like directly supporting a couple of people who are trying to make a place 
for everybody in Sonoma. It's not just about like the Ferraris we drive and stuff. And but it maybe it really does meet you where you are in there. your wine journey. Like the way that Sam is talking about that, that is the ethos, that is the experience that everyone has when they, when they walk in the door stop. and have a tasting at Hillside. It's that no matter if you're a newbie or like a seasoned pro, there is yeah. a space for you to be encouraged and be delighted. And we yeah. can virtually bring you to Kibble Stop momentarily. We have some pictures of oh, uh, us when we visited so the tasting room so you can Thank see you, it. Sam. Yeah. yeah. We appreciate you being here. Thank you all. Filled my cup to come and chat with you. So I hope I was entertaining and fulfilled your expectations. It totally <laughs> was. You're always a treat, Sam. We love having you. Thank okay. you so much. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. All right. Oh, that was delightful. Yeah, Sam is great. We got to meet him when we were out in Sonoma recently and had lunch with him. And the Kibble Stout has amazing food. The food is yes. on par with these wines. And yeah, it's a, it's a great place to go if you're in, in California. What wines are you guys drinking? What are you sipping on? Sav Blanc. Jenna said Sav Blanc. I have the Zen. What do you so think? Good. Yeah, isn't it's that nice, isn't it? Curious? Yeah. Very curious. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely something that kind of it breaks a lot of people's neck. Yeah, they especially if you're, like, especially if you're a Zin drinker. Zinfandel, huh? Yeah. And then we, whoa. Yeah, Larissa's a little newer to wine. She's a beer girl historically, but if you're really familiar with Zin, it definitely is unique. Yeah. Danica, what are you guys sipping on over there? Um, we had this Sauv Blanc, which was excellent. It was definitely different from what we're used to, but I liked that one a lot. And we are working on the uh, rosé now. Cool. Nice. Yep. Great. Yeah. Do you want to, is there anything about the Sauv Blanc you want to mention why it's different from what maybe well, they're used to? Yeah. I mean, um, so a lot of times Sauvignon Blanc, um, especially examples that are coming from California um, and the ones that you see that are so popular from New Zealand, uh, are very frequently made solely in stainless steel vessels and um, they are kind of cranked out. They, you know, are, are processed through relatively with a, with a relatively quick fermentation um, that sometimes diminishes some of the like more ethereal aromas um, and you're, and you're stuck with the ones that are a little bit more straightforward. It's, it's melon, it's grapefruit. Grassy sometimes. So a little bit of grassiness. Um, and due to a combination of three things, one, uh, as Sam mentioned, the Sauvignon Blanc is from the Ecaterino Vineyard in Alexander Valley, which is, I think, the largest contiguously biodynamically farmed vineyard in Alexander Valley. It's, I want to say, 50 plus years old, which in the spectrum of how old uh, grapevines live, it's ridiculous how long that they are allowed to live when being cultivated, usually 20 years, uh, 25 to 30, sometimes at the outset. And around that age, um, they start to re like produce less fruit. But as Sam was kind of mentioning earlier, the fruit that they produce at that point is higher quality. It's like they've gone through their entire career. They've figured out how to do what they are designed to do to the best of their ability. But now they're retired and they're actually going to spend more time golfing. So you get a little bit of fruit, but it's really, really good fruit. Um, Great evolution. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, on top of that, this, uh, this wine, the Sauvignon Blanc, is aged not solely in stainless steel. It also sees a little bit of time in neutral oak which is porous and allows a little bit of interaction with the environment. That's something that- I wondered, about oak. I wondered about oak when I tasted it. I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, and, and, and Jenna, uh, another component that is also oftentimes complementary to that with oak is for white wines, the aging of the wine on the dead yeast cells, surly, creates a texture that is akin to um, the, the, it's really another textural component that you get from time spent in oak. Um, and so both of those things are going on with this Sauvignon Blanc, in addition to them being particularly old, great, uh, great vines, especially for Sauvignon Blanc. Cabernet Sauvignon, sure. Yeah, I feel like you don't 30, see. 30, 35 years. Sauvignon Blanc, it's really rare that it's White wines 20. in general, kind of, right? Yeah. Old vines for white wines. Old wine, kind of. white wine. Yeah. 
is is rare with the exception of maybe Riesling. Right, right. And if you see some old vine Riesling, get it. <laughs> or aged Riesling for that matter. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, the carbonic Zinfandel, Suzanne mentioned that, Larissa, you're drinking that, um, but Sam didn't really talk about what, what that really means. And it's kind of a fascinating thing too. Um, so generally grapes are brought in from the vineyard and they are either crushed and the juice is separated from you know, the rest of the solid matter and fermented. That's how white wine is made. Red wine, the grapes are crushed and they're allowed to sit on the skins, extracting color and flavor and tannins and things from the skins. Um, in carbonically fermented or macerated wines, the grapes are brought in and they are not crushed. They are allowed to sit in a cool environment covered with a layer of carbon dioxide. Oftentimes dry ice is used um, as that sublimates the carbon dioxide gases heavier. So it's surrounded by carbon dioxide. And like eventually- Like whole grapes, like whole cluster. Whole grapes. Well, and this is whole cluster, I believe how he does yeah. it. And what happens after about seven to 10 days of the grapes being removed from the plant that they're on is there's a spontaneous fermentation is not quite the right word, but it is a form of that because it's not initiated by yeast because it happens in a sealed grape, but it starts to consume its own sugars until it bursts. And then it's allowed to continue fermenting normally. But that initial process allows for a real, the profile of this Zinfandel where it's really light and bright. And uh, frankly, one of the few things that you find in the wine world that tastes grapey are carbonically masked. It's the weirdest thing that the only time you ever smell grape in wine is for me, things that are carbonically macerated like this. Yeah, um, it's pretty fun. It really is. It also, in, like, because the skins are not really involved yet, um, the fermentation progresses to a point where you're not getting as much interaction with the skin, so you don't have as much depth of color um, and perhaps sometimes as much richness and tannins, which you don't always want, you know? Yeah. Just because they're fun with some wines doesn't mean that they're the only way that you can enjoy that grape and the only way that grape can be made in wine. Yeah. We just moved to the Zinfandel and I just want to like smell it. Like it smells so good. I just want to keep smelling it. Yeah. Yeah. You're defying the glue glue idea though, because you're supposed to just like glue, 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 glue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's agree. honestly one of my favorite. It's super wines. unique. Yeah. It's really quick. And it's fun. So you may notice that the Casey Labs um, label is pretty different than these other labels. And so speaking of art and how passionate Sam is about art, um, they do, they have an artist, a local artist who kind of makes these labels for them. And they're all based on Jordan, the founder's familial connection. So father's watch is kind of talking about his father. There's sibling rivalry. There's twice removed rosé talking about twice removed relatives. And so they all Old have a wives story. tale, which is like grandma's like yeah wandering stories and they have really um, pretty like blown up versions of them in their tasting room um but the casey labs one so it looks very different because you know the the challenge with making wine which sam was touching on a little bit is often when you're working at a winery you end up kind of cranking out the same stuff year after year because that's what sells and that's what people like and so you're constantly making those same wines which stifles the creativity of these artists, you know, people like Sam who really take their craft seriously, who want to experiment and play and try new things. And one of the biggest barriers to doing that is if you play and experiment and try something new and no one likes it, you have to spend all this money on the label and all this money on like all of that infrastructure, it makes it, you can't, like you just can't do that at a reasonable cost. And so what they've come up with is this Casey Labs label that they use on different things that they experiment with occasionally. Now this has been, this Casey Lab Zin has been in existence for quite a while. I'm a little surprised they haven't moved it into yeah, one of these yet. Point, we they should ask them about that. A proper commissioned label yeah. piece of artwork. But that is <laughs> one of, you know, so they do other Casey Labs ones as well. So it's kind of like a sub-brand that's basically like the winemaker had an idea and he wanted to go play. 
And so it's a Casey Labs, you know, kind of thing. For example, this co-fermentation of Sauvignon Blanc and Gravenstein apples, definitely you know, we, part of the we Casey. We can't get it to show it's well weird. on the, it's because there's light behind us. I don't know. You can kind of see it there. It's Casey Labs. But this one's really cool because it's co-fermented Gravenstein apples with Sauvignon Blanc, um, which is really quite fun. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. But it's a, it's a fun story. I love talking about the wine label art. That's super cool. We, we've talked about beer can art, but we haven't really talked about wine label art. And yeah, I feel like it's, it's a little bit less common in the wine world. Although some of our favorite wineries do it. Yeah. So Kevil Scott does, Jolie Laid does uh -huh. this as well. Um, Where every, every vintage is a unique piece of art. Imagery is probably one of the first wineries that is that, that, that did that. Um, those of you who aren't familiar, Imagery is a spinoff of Benzinger which is a pretty big, pretty well-known, still family-owned winery um, that uh, I think is the oldest organically farmed vineyard in California, or at least in Sonoma. Either way, imagery. I, mean, I like how he looks at me when he's saying that, like, like I would know the answer to that question. <laughs> the, the, the crazy thing about imagery is not only do they have, you know, a unique piece of artwork for this wine, their Sauvignon Blanc, they have a unique piece of artwork for the 2019 Sauvignon Blanc, and then for the 2018 and the 2017. And every vintage of that wine is a completely different piece of art. Um, incredible like endeavor, like whoever's in charge of curating the artists for you know, the, the 20 different bottlings that they make every year and have for yeah. 30 years. Yeah. You walk around their tasting room and everywhere is another little piece of fun artwork. But yeah, I, I love that I love that Kibblesad does that. And it's an interesting point that KC Labs has, at least the Zinfandel, hasn't been incorporated into their primary portfolio yet. Yeah, we been should ask them a while. Yeah. I'd be curious. <clears throat> Other questions? Because otherwise we'll just keep talking. <laughs> This is awesome. I have to jump because I have to get up early and yeah, yeah. you're on East Coast time. <laughs> I have East Coast and I really want to open the other wines and I know that I shouldn't. Uh, so I will be saving those for this weekend. For sure. Um, thanks, guys. Let us know what you think about the Zinfandel when you open it. Yeah, I will. <laughs> Bye, sure. guys. Good night. Does everyone know how to use their handy dandy wine wheel that they got? Larissa, you're not really. I've seen them, obviously, but have never really used one. Yeah. Larissa, do, do you use these in the beer world? I mean, I know there are beer wheels, but is it common in the beer world to kind of use beer wheels? Um, yeah. For, yeah. Yeah. More on the producer side than the consumer side, though? Yes. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, as people are learning. And it's more, yeah, more, yeah, mostly for hops and then, you know. Malt. And a lot of people don't really, it's hard to really just discern hot flavors. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we really love tools like this. We do have a hop wheel and a malt wheel that we've used for beer in the past. Yeah. I'll have to run it by you to see. And the aroma wheel with beer. Focused. Yeah, the aroma wheel yeah. too. Um, so these are really fun, especially, you know, so I always feel like, you know, Evan trained for years and years to get his nose and palate and spent lots of money and time to become a certified sommelier. Um, and for those of us who haven't done that though, you know, he'll say things like, oh, there's burnt caramel in there or like tart cherry or preserved cherry versus fresh cherry, you know? And so he like can do that from the top of his head sometimes. <laughs> and for those of us, but it, it's a Even training. for me, yeah. this is, can be very helpful. Well, and especially if you're not training regularly, which you don't always, you sure. know, unless, you know, especially when we're drinking other things and things like that. But really your sense of smell is one of the few senses that you can actually train. Um, you know, if your eyesight starts to go, you can't do exercises to like make it stronger. I wish you could. I mean, you as soon as I turned 40, I needed glasses. readers. It's a, yeah, exactly. That doesn't make it stronger. It doesn't like some, some kind of glasses, depending on the certain like vision, like impediment um, like you can strengthen maybe yeah you might be right, right. i think you might be right like but if you got a lazy eye if you wear glasses it'll like kind of like get stronger maybe i don't know anyway. but i think it's most most senses like you kind of have what you have and it's hard to kind of improve on the, your nose though you kind of lose how to use your nose if you're not actively using it regularly and because it is a passive 
um, kind of, it is a passive sense. You don't go around actively smelling things and kind of being like, that smells like this, that compared smells like this, that, senses, compared yeah. to other senses. So this is helpful because as you stick your nose in here and so swirling, sipping, you know, smelling, trying to identify what you smell in there, this can be really helpful because you basically start in the center. So you kind of start in the middle. And so a lot of times you'll maybe land on like fruity, right? That's a common place to start. And she'll say, okay, this is, this smells fruity. And it's like, great. Well, what does that mean? Hopefully you, you aren't landing on chemical too right. much. Unless it's Riesling maybe <laughs> occasionally. Um, and so with fruity, then you would kind of, I'm going to do it with this one. I feel like or you do it with one. No, too. Yeah. So I'm going to do it with the like. red blend. Reds are sometimes a little. Basically what, what Suzanne was kind of getting at is that I'll go down to a level of minutia in a first like he'll start at the outside of the wheel yeah and that's hard it's not it's very that's, hard like you might be able to say fruity and kudos to you if you can say you know this is berry fruit versus this is stone right. fruit versus this is orchard fruit versus right. this is tropical fruit but then figuring out like okay of the tropical fruits it's pineapple and the state of the pineapple is that it's canned pineapple as opposed to caramelized pineapple as opposed to dried right. pineapple as opposed to pineapple tart or whatever but that's how i always push suzanne is that when she says and it's awesome. cherry i say is what it kind of cherry? cherry right or is it uh right you know <laughs> yeah and so you know it, so it's fun to really kind of push yourself and kind of say okay so it's fruity what kind of fruity it's berry oh is it blackberry oh black currant i wouldn't have even thought of black currant but there is something i'm smelling in here that's a little off from just blackberry, raspberry, strawberry, maybe that is kind of black currant, but then you can kind of go around and be like, well, maybe that's something else. Maybe that's in this burnt caramel kind of area that sure. I'm smelling, right? And so, and the reason why it matters is not just to be like a total dork. It matters, um, <laughs> which Evan is. By that's not the, that would never be the reason why it Sometimes matters. you like to geek out on things, <laughs> but the reason to do this is because the better you can describe what you like in wine and what you don't like in wine, the better you're going to be able to order a glass of wine at a restaurant and nail it and get something that you love, right? Or go to a bottle shop and say, I wanna try something new, but I'm not really sure what to do. I haven't explored things from Spain before. I really like, and it's not as helpful if you're just like, I really like Cabernet. Well, okay, then I'm just gonna show you what like a version of a Cabernet is that's grown in Spain. And there's lots of different right. expressions of Cabernet. Right, because not, and so a Chardonnay is a great example where most people don't like all Chardonnays. They like certain types of Chardonnays. They either like them to be buttery and okay and rich. Or they don't rich, think they like Chardonnay at all. Or they like them to be lean and more like closer to that Sauvignon Blanc end of the spectrum. But if you just go around saying, I don't like Chardonnay, instead of saying, I don't like these types of Chardonnays that have these flavor profiles, but I like these, it just allows you to like play more. It allows you to try new wines and not just always order the same thing every time. And it's honestly just fun. Like the longer I've gotten to know Evan, the better I've gotten at this because we converse about it. We just have like, I smell and I say something and he asks me a question and I go back and forth. So the more you use this and the more you talk about it and it makes a glass of wine an experience instead of just like a beverage, a beverage, right? You're talking about it. You're experiencing it. You're finding weird things in it. And you're like, wait, what is that? I've never smelled that before. Can you find what that is? I can't identify that. Um, and so we really like these tools because it helps you do all of those things. So we encourage you to use it regularly and often. Don't just put it in a drawer now that you have it, which I know is easy to do, but leave it out near your wine, you know, wherever you keep your wine glasses or whatever, and pull it out and test yourself a little bit before you just start drinking it with your dinner or whatever. It, it, it does, uh, I feel like, make the experience a little bit more immersive. It allows you to kind of pause and just like be. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, Jay. Hi, Kristen. Hi. Can you hear me all right? We sure can. All right, cool. I'm, I'm making uh, pumpkin, uh, digital pumpkins as we speak, so. Cool. Yeah. All right. It's almost, uh, it's all, almost Halloween time, huh? Yeah, it is almost Halloween, and I'm excited about pumpkin spice season. Is that your avatar there, your costume? Is yeah, that's, <laughs> that, that's what I use for work. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. Perfect. But I'm excited because, uh, you know, I've, I've missed out on the last uh, two decades on pumpkin spice season. And I think that I'm finally ready to be an adult and commit to it. Oh, 
Is that what being an adult is, is committing to pumpkin spice season? <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, it's been totally. so played out over the last two decades. And, you know, now that it's, it's not cool to do it, now I want to do it. Oh, I sure. see. So you've avoided it because everyone was doing it. And now that we're all like looking our, down our noses at pumpkin spice, you're in. Right. I'm going to be contrarian. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I feel like Halloween this year is going to be big because Halloween hasn't been a thing for the past two years. And I feel like people are going to go a little nutty at Halloween this year since like COVID has kind of. Do you guys think that we could be Buddy Holly and marry Tyler Moore? Why did we have that idea? Where did that come from? I think we were listening to Weezer. Oh yeah, that's exactly right. We were listening to Weezer and we were like, wait, we kind of could pull that off. We look like them. And if you get the flip in your hair. Yeah, I mean, I have the flip in my hair. What do you mean if I get the flip in my hair? (laughs) I have to be like more extreme real turn more extreme you need a permanent like ultra smile if you're going to be um buddy holly no 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 uh mary tyler Moore. yeah i can do that i'm on board jay did you try any of the lines or oh go ahead Kristen. Oh, i was just saying random buddy holly comment um i can give you esoteric buddy holly tips because my aunt um was buddy holly's like high school sweetheart and I had most of like most of his songs are actually written about her um no how are you going to stumble upon this yes yes um so she actually her mother was kind of a hoarder and when her mom passed away she they actually donated all of she had kept all of the love letters he wrote to her and all of these things and she donated them all to the Buddy Holly Museum so what? That's yeah. the coolest thing ever. We're gonna have to go back and listen to some Buddy Holly songs and <laughs> learn all about Kristen's aunt here. <laughs> yeah, her name was her name was Echo. Um, she's my my by by marriage. I'm not blood related to her, but by marriage, she she ended up breaking up with Buddy Holly and marrying my uncle instead. So, wow. I'd like to meet your uncle too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now we need to meet your uncle. He beat out Buddy. <laughs> Impressive. Cool. So um, is anyone traveling anytime soon? We said at the end of these SIP Scout sessions, we're always going to leave a little time for like, if anyone's traveling anytime soon and they want to do a little SIP Scouting in terms of like, where should I drink? Where should I go? What should I eat? Because, you know, the the people that SIP Scout attracts are people like us who like to travel through food and drink. If there's time for a historical monument in between breweries and wineries and restaurants, maybe. Yeah. If there's a site to be seen near a craft maker, cool. Let me figure it out. Anyone need any? Go ahead. We should have asked this like two months ago because we've been traveling like nonstop over the last like two months. We were in Jamaica and we were in Columbus and we were... I was in Seattle, but we're going to Fayetteville, Arkansas next weekend. So oh, I don't know if anyone's been there because there, I don't know how much is actually there, but <laughs> yeah, that was a little obscure. Fayetteville, Arkansas. <laughs> I do know I that. Should have, go ahead. Oh, I should have asked you guys about hey. Seattle before I went there. That's actually, isn't Fayetteville where Walmart is based? Yep. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, that's right. It is Ben. So from what? Oh, that's Bentonville. That's right. Not Fayetteville. Yeah, that's okay. right. I'm like, I do think Arkansas is known for Applejack, mm-hmm. like the spirit Applejack. Um, and I'm trying to remember, I always get confused about what Applejack is. It's like apple brandy, but it's spiked, I think, like higher alcohol. It's, it's higher like it's alcohol somehow. and it's jacked because the apple cider is fermented and it's fermented in places that are cold which is weird mm-hmm. that uh, at, you know Arkansas would be known for this I think it's historically it's cold, more of a Arkansas. northern thing uh-huh. and what happens is the water freezes yep. and they pull the water out and the alcohol the ethanol doesn't freeze and so it remains so the yeah, ice- I learned that on moonshiners okay ah, cool uh-huh. Uh-huh. and that's how it gets jacked is yep. the removal of the frozen water yeah, I don't know why I think Arkansas is kind of known for that, but I kind of think they are. So uh, I just looked it up on a map and Fayetteville is pretty close to the Missouri line and very close to all of the Ozarks. Mm. Um, I would strongly recommend if you can get over this way, I didn't Google how far it is, but Hot Springs National Park is kind of amazing. And it's in the Ozarks area. Yeah. 
Cool, um, okay. So Fayetteville is actually very close to Bentonville. Okay. And fun fact, I don't know if you guys know this, but um, there was a petition that may have been started by the Walton family to move the capital of Arkansas to Bentonville because that's where all the commerce was coming. That's like Walmart commanded that. And that's where all the business travelers were coming. And so there was money coming in because everybody has to go sit in front of Walmart if they want to get their product on the shelf. Um, mm. Interesting. And in my yeah. time doing wine tours, I met someone who wanted to start a wine in, uh, I'm sorry, distribution company in Arkansas where he lived because there was terrible wine. It's like, there's all these head honchos of like manufacturers coming to Arkansas to pitch their product to Walmart and they want to wine and dine them, but there's no wine to wine and dine them with. It's just like all this swill wine. And so he was like, I'm going to be the distributor that brings <laughs> in the good wine to Arkansas. You anyway, did it? yeah, oh, oh yeah, did. yeah. Max and I took him and his like colleagues around for an extended weekend, visiting all the places of like the premier wineries that are unique and would be special, and that he could be the sole distributor of in a place like Arkansas. That's wild. That's you awesome, make it to but it's smart. That's smart. Super you make smart. it to Bentonville. Um, I have heard that there's a decent food scene there and there's a really good food truck park. Like yeah, there's a, know. like if you're there for the weekend, like on Friday and Saturdays in, in particular, but it's a permanent food truck park, you know, with flights and they're not going anywhere. Those are cool. Of, have, they have a lot of those in Portland, I think, right? Portland has, yeah. I think they have laws in Portland where you have to be permanent food trucks. And you can't yeah. Mobile or something. Yeah. 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 So Benville has a lot of that going on. They also have a world-class art museum thanks to the Walton family. Yeah, I do feel um, like Bentonville attracts a lot because Walmart is so big and they have so many vendors coming and like all that kind of stuff, right? It's really built itself up over the years. So I can't remember the Walton daughter's name, but she's a major art collector and she put all, she built a custom museum and put all her stuff in a museum. And I've heard it, it rivals the quality of museums you would go to in any major city. So. Wow. Wait, speaking of art at uh, wineries, so we just heard, so I don't know if anyone is familiar with the Donham Estate, you should look it up, the Donham Estate, D-O-N-U-M, um, they're in Sonoma, it's one of my favorite Pinot producers, and unfortunately, really delicious Pinot is often pretty expensive, and so it's <laughs> like, you not know, wine that we drink, for 80 or $90 a bottle for their Pinot, um, but it's fantastic, um, Bob, you would really, I think, I, have we had this with your, with your dad? I think it'd be your kind of Pinot, Bob. Um, but they just revamped. So they've always been really known for art at their winery. They've had Ai Weiwei um, sculptures. They have um, Botero, Botero sculptures at their winery. So it's always been lovely to go there, spend way too much money on the wine and like walk around and see these sculptures. They just, re they just opened or revamped their whole winery and tasting room. And they have this beautiful like stained glass, like, it's this yeah, like theater kind of palisade. Uh, I'm sorry, not it's palisade. It's crazy. Um, like outdoor um, palazzo, I guess. But the tastings now. So to do a tasting there and get on their thing and get brought around the whole property to see all this new amazing art that they have for a tasting, it's five hundred dollars. That's not for any tasting. That's for, for the special, the art, one. the art kind of whatever. That's crazy. <laughs> crazy oh, yeah. i mean and it's always been and it makes me so sad because they really do make one of my like my favorite pinots like ever and i'm just like oh man you are just going crazy over there um yeah it's wild for sure i'm on their website right now and it looks amazing it is amazing it's a, and so i do think they do have cheaper you know tastings that you can do but it's really cool to be able to walk around with a glass of wine and kind of see this art and hang out but the transcend experience sounds like something that I need I to experience really yeah yeah it's five hundred dollars for three hours there it is. So it's, oh it's that studio and other space we'll share it we'll yeah share it. Open. if anybody has ever been to um Turnbull that was always one of my favorite things for them they they do photography mostly Ansel Adams and other 
um, sort of landscape uh, photography. But yeah, you can walk around their gallery with a glass of wine for just a, the normal tasting fee. But if they decide they like you, they'll take you into back rooms with your glass of wine and show you the stuff that's throughout all the hallways everywhere. Yeah, the that is beautiful. gallery at- um, Not beautiful. It's gorgeous. Domain Burner. Arneros? No. Like this is all their art. Oh they have the Ai Weiwei like 12 zodiacs there. Like we, we've seen that, it's, it's incredible. It's like going to an art museum, but what wine? <laughs> Pretty fun. Well, the wine is also part of the art museum. Yeah, for sure. Um, anyway, does anyone want to see Kibblesat real quick before we we? Yeah, take we got some cool pictures of their we their do have space. Some cool pictures of their space. Um, to encourage you, especially you, Kristen, you're nearby. Have you been to Kibblesat Cellars? I haven't. While you guys were talking, I googled where it was and. And I looked around on their website. I'm sorry, go ahead, Kristen. Oh, I just was saying I was poking around on their website and we sh I should totally go because it's really close by. It's Southern Sonoma. So it's yeah, even easier it's, to get to. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the, the Donham bottlings, it's not Zodiac. Uh, the Ai Weiwei sculptures are the year of the horse. And the, I'm sharing, uh, sorry. Oh no, maybe they can, they can see it on your thing. It's like the year of the horse and the year of the monkey. So it's, um, oh, okay. it's okay. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. All right. This is us with Sam. <clears throat> Evan has crazy hair. And shirt. Like, um, this is their new wine garden. So it's all like outdoor and beautiful. They have fire pits and lights and like great food, Kristen. Like really delicious food. Um, this is Jordan on the left, the, the founder. Right. And you can see, I put in the chat earlier, I don't know if you guys saw this, as saving the world one keg at a time. So he actually invented free flow wines, which if you've ever been to a restaurant or a bar that has wine on tap, that's his system, basically. Like, so he helps wines, like high quality wines, get into kegs so that they can get into this tap system. And, you know, and it's awesome because at their winery, you can actually bring, like, they basically have growlers for wine. So you can bring wow. it back whenever you go and get discounted refills of their wine. And it's just amazing. Um, so he's, he's beyond starting an amazing winery. He's a real innovator. Uh, right uh, there in the middle oh, is uh, their old general manager, Miles, uh, Miles Bergen. Um, this is another kind of fun thing about yeah. the wine, wine world. Uh, you see what he's holding in his hand there? Is that beer? Tecante? Yeah. That's it Tecante. is Tecante. That, that's red beer. Good eye, Larissa. Um, and there's a, there's a pretty uh, popular turn of phrase in Napa is that it, it takes a, a lot of cheap beer to make fine wine. Um, I think it's actually, it takes a lot of crappy beer to make fine wine. <laughs> what is it? Tea. Oh. Same thing. Same thing. Yeah. 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 Um, and and it's, it's basically the sentiment that um, after a long day of making wine, you, you don't want to drink it. You, you don't want to sit there and like, you can't taste wine and drink wine and enjoy wine after a long day of making wine because your whole brain is all about like, well, what, what am I going to do to fix this or yeah. change this or make it different? Yeah. You just, yeah want to have a beer yeah and that's actually it's funny in england um cider is that it takes a lot of cider to make good wine in england and that's where that cider culture in england is very robust mm. over there um wine garden hopping and rocking and rolling there there's sam hard at work some of their vineyards with the beautiful views of yeah this is the country. one estate vineyard up in north and like basically the middle of sonoma valley uh, most of their fruit they source from other vineyard owners uh, in Mendocino and other parts of Sonoma. And then they have the one estate vineyard, uh, which the Syrah component of the Father's Watch uh, comes from. from. Barrels. This is their old barrel room, I think, mm -hmm. at, at their old tasting room. Um, but they often do, you know, wine club parties and things of that nature. So this, you can see their tap system. So they have the tap system in their winery. Um, for some of the more, I think for the KC Labs ones, they actually pour them into beakers to kind of pour and bring mm -hmm. out to you, which is kind of fun. Um, so you can see here, we did a, this is when we were there, we did a side-by-side -side of their KC Labs Syrah versus their couple stop sellers Syrah and kind of did a side-by-side -side of those. 
and then they're bottling line where they're bottling their rosé. This isn't terribly easy to see, but. Uh, oh yeah, that's one of their. When you go there, you can basically get, get one, one of these. Those. And refill it. Uh, swivel top uh, bottles filled up. We have, we have sugar water in it at the moment for our hummingbirds. <laughs> More of their beautiful wine garden. That's what the grapes probably look, well, all the white grapes are probably in right now, but they did look like that recently since we're right in the middle of harvest. Yeah, there's that same swivel top bottle that we have. And it's really cool because I don't know, I like the beer industry has really taken off with growlers and, you know, beer enthusiasts locally, like that's a really big thing. So I, I'd love to see this take off more at wineries. Um, and especially because, you know, glass is one of the most unsustainable parts of the wine industry. It's really expensive to ship around. It's really expensive, like part of the wine. So if you can take that out of the equation and yeah. just get the juice. Yeah, you get a liter yeah. bottle filled up for, I think, slightly less than the same price of a 750 corked bottle. When you Do you um, know, like, shelf life of those? Because I know, like, with growlers and crowlers that, you know, it's, you know, you would want to drink it within 24 to 48 hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's similar. Um, they are a little bit less pushy than I've experienced most. Less carbed, probably. I mean, are, yeah. yeah, the carbonation. Well, but the nice thing about the fact that Kivelsad and Jordan, you know, really kind of came up with this manufactured process of being able to keg wine is that right. they have the preservation yeah. components um at the forefront of what they're doing and okay. so prior to filling up the you know the bottle with wine they gas it and they Carpet, yeah. presence of mind to do that and i think a lot of people would yeah so they gas it fully uh and then fill it with wine which probably makes it last even longer yeah and i would say i mean i wouldn't do it much more than like five days but it's it's right up to the very top that they then squeeze it down. So effectually, there is no air in there at all. Well, and that's actually our trick for preserving wine yourself at home. So even if you get one of those, if you take a glass or two out of it, if you just put it the rest of it back into a smaller bottle like this and fill it all the way up to the top and seal it, like like air is really what's the enemy in wine um, because it's and not beer. carbonated. Beer too, sure, but the carbonation I feel like is a little bit like touchier. Um, and so if you keep downsizing your growler into smaller, smaller, and just keep that air out of it and keep it in the fridge as well, it will last for a week, maybe, maybe even two, honestly, um, if you're just very careful about that. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you know that does, does oxidation, like I know oxygen is a big thing in beer. Is, is that a, a thing with wine as well? Yeah, for sure. And that's why you want to kind of really like downsize it and get it up to the tippy tippy top so there's very minimal air in there okay yeah but we'll open a bottle and drink it four days later you know and from, from any winery honestly as long because we're just careful about downsizing there's some yeah. of their delicious food suzanne is happy wine and food yeah and there's some of their blown up their labels um, on the wall with kind of, and they all have like a very robust story behind them about the person and about like why it's called that. And so it's a really kind of fun element to their brand. More vineyards. You know, maybe that's why they don't have a QC Labs Zin. Um, in the, in the permanent portfolio, because maybe they've run out of family members. <laughs> they don't know who to name it after. Yeah. They don't have a story they need to, to like, tell. Have a new niece. Oh, yeah. Like. Yeah. Out here too. And there, there we go. Yeah. So I, I highly encourage anyone in California to. Um, yeah. Good stuff. To head on over there because they're they're great and I can't stop sharing. So I don't know what to do. There we go. Like. Let's stop sharing. Yeah. All right. Anyone else need any travel tips before we leave? I know we tried to cover Danica. Anyone else going anywhere? I don't think we have any upcoming. I put uh, two links in the uh, chat for some uh, unique sort of seasonal stuff. Um, the Westland Whiskey is a whiskey that is 
mm. aged in a barrel that you can only find the wood out here in Washington State, mm. out, out in the Olympias, I believe. Uh, and so that creates this really, really tasty whiskey. And then Paul's done that. Hey, Jay, Westland also does some single malts, American single malts, too, I think. Using right? Washington peat, if yeah. I understand. Yes, 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 exactly. Cool. Yeah. And then, you know, it's fall and I'm super pumpkin spice man now. So uh, the St. George hey, uh, the spice pear liquor is going to be a great little liqueur to mix with, say, coffee or cream or something. Yeah, St. George does amazing stuff. They're out of um, Alameda, technically, but Oakland, California. And they are one of the OGs of the craft distilling movement. They, they like really kind of started like, let's let's do this stuff right and stop making things chemically delicious like all the mass makers and let's do it small scale with fresh fruit and hand zesting and um so everything saint george makes is really quite amazing yeah jay if you're in inclined this way which i feel like generally you are there's a there's a great book called proof uh -huh. um and it's all about the art of distillation but it talks about lance winter's experiment at, at saint george and he did some so this is a liqueur, but you know that he also does a pair of eau de vie. Yeah. And he has a, a litany of eau de vies of like the most fantastically crazy things that you can imagine, like kombu uh, seaweed and crab and foie gras and hibiscus. And like, Tell everyone what an eau de vie is. So um, eau de vie literally translates to water of life. And many of them are essentially like a distillation of um, a, a single component. So in the case of a pear eau de vie, um, pears are the sole ingredient that is used to be fermented and then after it's fermented, distilled. Um, and it's not aged in wood, it's really just- They're almost like unaged distilled. brandy. Yeah, kind yeah. of. They're almost like an unaged apple brandy or something like that, but you can make, you can make eau de vies from- Pretty I mean, much anything. anything. Um, uh, and so he does some super really wild cool. stuff. Great book. and. I would love to try foie gras eau de vie. <laughs> Sounds delicious. Hey, Jay, is that picture of you uh, that we're seeing here, is that pumpkin spice that's rubbed all over your chest? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, it, that's it is Super seasonal. Pumpkin Spice Man. He carries a Bowie knife. Watch out. Okay. Yeah. That's, what, that's what we've named him, Super Pumpkin Spice Man. Yeah, that's a uh, self-portrait that I made of myself. <laughs> nice. Those are his yeah. actual abs. Yeah, and I, I captured the lightning. The lightning was actually happened. So it's not just drawn in there for artistic sake. It's, you know, I, I captured the moment. Ads, I'm pretty sure those are dinner rolls, Hawaiian dinner rolls, Hawaiian, King Hawaiian dinner rolls, right? That's great. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much for coming for, to our first Sip Scout party. We love having you here. Um, we are growing, 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 getting more members every single time. We have a bunch of people who did not make it tonight but hopefully they'll make it next time so keep showing up tell keep all joining your friends. us tell all your friends we are super excited next month is um oh show them our little it's not exactly oh, yeah. the right beer but next month you will be getting an oktoberfest beer kit um danica is very excited um these are not my the exact favorite beer. yeah Oktoberfest is my favorite fest yeah <laughs> so we we will certainly be dressed up in our dirndl and all of our fun stuff evan will probably be singing some german songs because that's what he does. Um, and yeah, we're going to have a great time. And there's going to be some bonus goodies in there as well. Does any of us could drink it by ourselves? Drink, He's going to start now. Drink, drink, <laughs> That's not a German song. Drink. Well, drink, drink. Yeah. See, and then, yeah, yeah, there you go. And First. then the following month will be a whiskey tasting. And then in December, we will be doing our holiday mixology class, which will be super fun. We'll make holiday drinks and there's enough for two people in there. So you'll get three cocktails and make two of each and all sorts of fun stuff. So, yeah. Cheers. We love seeing all your faces. For Thank sure. you. Thank you for your support. And 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 super pumpkin spice fan faces. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great night, everyone. See you guys. Bye, guys. Bye. Cheers. Cheers.